Hi, right, ladies and gents, welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. It's great to see so many people in the audience and so many students as well. So welcome. And welcome to Kimberly, who's presenting today. And um, Kimberly is known to many of you. She was a student here, a PhD student, as well as an honors student to the BSc in geochemistry here at WITS and a PhD together with Roger and I. And the subject of her talk this evening is focused on her PhD work. Uh, for which she spent a large amount of her time at Boston College working on ultra high precision garnet geochronology. Um, I think enjoying your time and you're very cool there. Um, and of course, Kimberly is now a member of SARC as well. She is um, an, in charge of the isotope geoscience lab, the ultra clean metal free laboratory that we have here in the school, and which will soon be added to with several other mass spectrometers, which is very exciting. So, Kimberly, welcome. Our second newest member of staff, I think. And next week we'll have our newest member of staff speaking. So, Kimberly, over to you. Thank you. We'll get to talk. Uh, and while I'm doing that, welcome, uh, welcome to everyone online. And thank you, John Hancock, for sponsoring the drink and chips. All right, Kim, over to you. Thank you, Brad. Yes, so as the title of my talk suggests, uh, they will be discussing amphiblite facies metamorphism in the West Randwood rocks exposed in the Fredport Dome, and I will be proposing a Fentersdorp timing for this metamorphism. So in terms of geological background, for those of you who don't know about the Fredport Dome, it is an approximately 90 kilometer wide central uplift of a 2.023 million uh, billion year old meteorite impact structure. Uh, the core of the dome is TTG Archean Lysis, surrounded by a collar of 25 kilometer uh, wide collar of steeply dipping to overturned supercrustals of the Vidvatisrand, Bentisdorf and Transvaal supergroups. We see variable grades of metamorphism across the dome, which is then higher than the rest of the Witts Basin. So we can see here that in the core of the dome, we have granulite facies metamorphism that goes into amphibolite facies for the outer part of the core and the inner part of the collar, as well as going into then our green schist. We also have post-shock metamorphism that has very high temperatures right in the center of the dome of greater than 1,000 degrees Celsius that decreases radially. The neocrustal to paleoproterozoic geotherm for the central part of the crop or craton has been estimated between 15 and 20 degrees C per kilometer. However, many of the metamorphic rocks in the innermost part of the collar of the Fredport Dome have an apparent geotherm of 40 degrees C per kilometer. So what caused <laughs> this increase in apparent geotherm? We'd like to propose magma addition, and we have four main groups of our magmatic intrusions in the collar of the Fredport Dome. We have the Fentersdorp supergroup um, intrusions, then we have our Bushveldt in grey hair and condo, which comprises the Anna's Rust sheet as well as associated baroic intrusions, and we finally have the Karoo dolerite. Most authors in the past have favored a bushveld age in metamorphism, um, but accurate chronology has certainly proven to be a problem with argon argon yielding, um, no nice plateaus, and ages between 2000 and 2100 million years overlapping both the emplacement of the bushveld complex and the meteorite impact. So, what did I do? I looked at a sample sitting here in the northwestern collar of the dome, sample K12C. It is a garnet bearing metapelite and I did some Sumerian neodymium chronology. In 1995, it was proposed a PT path, an anti-clockwise PT path with a thermal maximum at 570 to 600 degrees C, at about 3.5 to 4.5 kilobars that was followed by a near isobaric cooling that culminated in rapid decompression associated with the meteorite impact. 
This M1A metamorphism was proposed to be related to the emplacement of the Bushnell complex. This was based on circumstantial evidence because in order to get our pressures of 3.5 to 4.5 kilobars, you needed to have the entirety of the Vigatisrant, Ventersdorp, and Transvaal supergroups, and you needed an input of heat, thus a bushfire timing was proposed. So sample K12C, here we've got a full section image in both um, XPL and PPL, and you can see it is a layered sample. We have metapolitic layers as well as a more semitic layer. There is garnet throughout the entire sample. Uh, you can see that we have two foliations, the S1 foliation is parallel to bedding and S2 is oblique to bedding defined by these biotype porphyroblasts. These are our schema phase maps. And so red is garnet, yellow is quartz, um, our orange is the biotype and the green is the muscovite and the chlorite. We also have um, some pseudotacolite present throughout the sample that displaces in both a finstral and a dextral sense. This pseudotacolite also cross cuts and offsets the metamorphic mineral assemblage. If we look at one of our garnets here, you can see that our main inclusion compositions are quartz, ilmenite, and there's also some apatite inclusions. But what is of interest as well is these overgrowths, these irregular overgrowths on the garnet grain. So the pseudotacolite, as I mentioned, cross cuts our main metamorphic mineral assemblage. So you can see here it is cross cutting our garnet one as well as our garnet overgrowths, garnet two. And here's probably the rest of that garnet grain. And we have chloride two growth um, of these coarse chloride along the pseudotacolite. Our pseudotacolite has also been recrystallized um, and contains either microclasts or neoblasts of garnet. So something has happened to our pseudotacolite after its impact formation. So if we look at our Tima uh, phase and manganese element map, so the Tima, as many of you know, is the test gap integrated mineral analyzer. And we can see we have our garnet one cores surrounded by our garnet two overgrowths, which are texturally very different. Um, and we can also see compositionally, these overgrowths are different. We have a normal prograde manganese path here with decreasing concentration from core to rim. And then we have this very distinct change in our manganese concentration in our garnet to overgrowths, suggesting that both texturally and chemically, there was either a second um, increase on the geotherm to cause this growth, or there was a period of time between the growth of garnet one and garnet two. We see the same kind of pattern in our EPMA element maps, where we have a very distinct change in our calcium concentration in garnet two, and the same in our manganese, as well as this normal prograde growth zoning. Our inclusions here, we can also see that they are apatite, quartz, and then we also have some ilmenite. So it's a very simple um, inclusion assemblage. So I took some whole rock, I uh, got some whole rock XRF, and I put together a thermocalc pseudo section. And we can see that going from our core to the mantle to the rim of our garnet, we have our manganese and garnet as well as our calcium and garnet isoplates. We have the assemblage of garnet, plagioclase, muscovite, phytite, chlorite, ilmenite as our peak assemblage. And our rims record our peak metamorphic uh, event at 500 degrees C and 3.13 kilobars. These temperatures are approximately the same, if not a little bit lower than those proposed in the past. However, the pressures are substantially lower, where previously they were 3.5 to 4.5, we are now sitting at 3.13. Our regular overgrowths, however, have much higher conditions. Temperature-wise, it's not that big a difference at 528. However, our pressure is substantially higher at 4.95 kilobars, higher than what has been proposed in the past. So how do we explain this? And what is the age of these garnets? So what I did is I took my samples across to the US and I generated a four point garnet whole rock isochron, which yields an age of 2,796 plus minus 1.52 million years, which is distinctly not a Bushveld age and is rather a Fentersdorp age. And in particular, it falls within the Klipperfeersberg group. 
Um, there has been a lot more debate uh, recently on the age of the Fentensdorf supergroup. In the past, it was quoted at 2,714 million years. However, now it seems to um, elapse over about a 100 million year range. So now we need to ask the question, where did the heat come from? Was the emplacement of a metadolorite sill or a dolorite sill stratigraphically beneath our sample enough to push up our temperatures to get to what we see in our metamorphism? So in order to answer this, I did some sill emplacement modeling. So here we have the um, eruption of the Clipper-Fersberg group. It does have a thermal influence on the rocks directly beneath it, but it loses a lot of its temperature upwards. But if we have no sill, you can see we are way too cold. We're sitting at about 200 degrees and we need to be at 500. So we need to have the emplacement of a sill to push us up to our 500 degrees. We can see from our pressures that for our garnet rims, not the overgrowths, we are coinciding at this depth. So if we have the emplacement of the sill with, uh, within a couple hundred meters of our sample, it is enough to push us up to our 500 degrees Celsius and our pressure intersects for the garnet rims. So having a Clipper-Fiersberg age for metamorphism does make sense. We do have a source to get our heat up there. But what about this overgrowth? You can see its pressure is substantially higher. So going back to what's been said before, what about the bush belt? So there are multiple bush belt age intrusions in the region surrounding this sample. And again, here you can see with no addition of any mafic material, we don't get to the temperatures we need to be at. But we do approximately reach our pressures if we have the rest of the uh, Fentersdorp as well as the, um, the Fentersdorp and then the Transvaal supergroup as well as a bit of bush box to give us enough pressure. If we intrude our sills, we now reach our temperature that we need. These sills are stratigraphically above the sample. And so you can see that these garnet two overgrowths may well be related to the bush belt. We don't have any strong chronological data to show this. However, through our um, PT, as well as the sill emplacement modeling, we can see that there is a very high potential that there is this bush belt overprint. So we put together a PT path. We have our VITS loading at a 20 degree C per kilometer geotherm, as has been uh, modeled. And we then have the starting of the Clipper-Fersberg group, which increases our temperature with very little increase to our pressure. We then hit our garnet cores, and we have our garnet growth at M1, which is our Clipper-Fersberg group metamorphism, followed by some near isobaric cooling related to our post Ventersdorf, but we have a little jump here that may well be related to any um, faulting as well as any temperature input and eruption of further lavas for the Plattberg and Peniel. We get back to our 20 degrees C per kilometer geotherm and we have our transfer loading followed by the emplacement of the bushfall complex, which pushes up our temperature. We get our M2, which is our garnet overgrowths. Um, and shortly thereafter, we have the meteorite impact at 2,023 million years. So we've got a nice, simple story. We have our primary metamorphic assemblage that developed um, concurrent with the Clipper Fersberg Logic Nest province with PT conditions of 500 degrees C and 3.13 kilobars. Then we have our garnet 2 overgrowth that we propose is related to the bush felt. And then we have the meteorite impact at 2023 that then forms these uh, pseudo light and the shock cleavage. We also see that there must be some post-impact heating because our pseudo light is recrystallized and we have the growth of chloride too. So kind of in general, what we're saying is that both Fentersdorf and Bushveld Logic Nest provinces have influenced the thermal evolution of the Bits Basin. But there's more to the story than that. I looked at a couple more samples. I looked at a metapelite from over here. I looked at a dolerite, and I looked at a kink banded mica layer in a quartzite. And we found some interesting things. So our sample VDA protocol, which is the metapelite, is 
a layered sample. We have our metapolitic layers as well as our metasemitic layers. We have our biotite and andalusite porphyroblasts in our politic layers, as well as some cordierite porphyroblasts in the more semitic layers. We have barnet present throughout the entirety of the sample. Our andalusite grains are either partially or fully replaced by a chloride, storolite, biotite intergrowth, as you can see here. So here you can see that this andalusite is only partially replaced along the edges, as is this one, whereas this andalusite is completely replaced by this uh, biotite chloride storolite. So looking at the chemistry of this sample, we can see that we have our different generations of different minerals. We have three generations of chloride. We have chloride one that makes up an S1 correlation along with our quartz. We then have chloride two, which is related to the storolite biotite chloride replacement. And finally, we have a chloride three um, present that is most likely similar to that chloride two overgrowth uh, or later growth that we saw in sample K12C. Um, we can also see in our garnets that we have a very distinct decrease in our calcium concentration. So it's a very uh, uh, distinct change. And we can see that this change in chemistry is offset by an impact related uh, fracture. So this potential growth of a garnet too is a pre impact effect. And again, we see the same prograde growth uh, zoning. So again, I took the sample and I did some uh, mineral equilibrium modeling on thermocalc. And this is only of the politic layers. And so we don't have any cordiorite present. So it is a texturally controlled um, and defined PT path with a peak assemblage of garnet, plagioclase, biotite, chloride, ilmenite, and leucite. And so we start, this is our garnet core, and we progressively grow garnet at the expense of our muscovite to get to our garnet rims. Then we have the growth of andalusite again at the expense of muscovite until we reach the field where muscovite is no longer present. Our peak um, PT, we are proposing somewhere around here because we do not have cordyrite present in our metapolitic layers and we don't have primary storolite present, thus we must be somewhere in this field, most likely around here which is giving us temperatures of 555 degrees C and about 2.6 kilobars. So again, lower pressures than we've seen before. We then have a retrograde path here where we have the formation of our storolite, biotite and um, chlorite replacement texture. Uh, we don't have any um, PT evidence for our overgrowths because the sample is so complex. We only find these overgrowths present in particular um, minerals, in particular association with minerals. And so we don't have the bulk composition because it is so variable. So I then took these garnets across to the US and dated them and got an age of 2689, uh, 0.6 plus minus 3.1 million years. So again, a distinctly not Bushveld age, but also not a Klipper-Fiersberg age and in fact, we are sitting somewhere in the pineal. So what happened? We've got two samples at approximately the same stratigraphic level in the rock, and they're about 20 kilometers apart, yet we've got 100 million year age difference between them. So again, we wanted to find our heat source. What caused this metamorphism? Is the emplacement of these sills over here that have been chemically correlated to the clipper fiersberg are they enough to push us up to the right temperatures? Do our pressures make sense in the area? So again, I did some thermal modeling. Again, with no sill, we're too cold. If we put our sill in, we are going to reach our 550 degrees Celsius. However, for our pressures, if we look at the garnet rims, we can see that we intersect with our uh, pressure gradient with a surface of uh, at the age of 2790, so without the flat vocal pineal present. But we get our peak pressures when we have the rest of that deposited. And so we need to have the entirety of the Fentersdorp deposited in order to get our pressures. Thus, it does make some sense to have it as a pineal timing, as our age suggests. So is it possible that our souls are pineal in age? 
So they have been chemically correlated with the Kiprofiesberg group, which is not always the best way. We would love to date them, and we will certainly look into dating these cells to get a more accurate age. But to throw another uh, spanner in the works, the cell itself is metamorphosed, and this metamorphism of the cell is pre-impact as well. And it's been metamorphosed termed for black fatties. So here we have a full section image of a sample from around the center of the cell, and you can see it has a pseudo igneous texture, and these grains are large horn blends. Whereas on the edges of our cells, we have these large horn blends in a finer grained matrix of actinolite. And our amphiboles are also zoned. We have a ferroedenite uh, rim as well as a magnesium horn blend core. So again, I tried to get some PT resolution for it. And for a sample from the edge of the sill, we got PT conditions of 470 degrees C and 3.1 kilobars. So our pressures align with that that we see in our metapelites, but our temperatures are substantially lower. And these may well be retrograde temperatures as we do have some evidence of retrograde features. For example, the growth of pinozoicite in the center of our plagioclase. Um, this here is just some evidence that the metamorphism is in fact pre-impact because we have pseudo -tacolite coming in and cross-cutting and off um, offsetting the metamorphic mineral assemblage. We then also used the um, Prismina Hornblade plagioclase geothermobarometer which gave us peak uh, temperatures of 560 degrees C, but a very large error on our pressure of two to 3.5 kilobars. So temperatures in line with what we are seeing in our P lights, but lower pressures. So some evidence of retrogression, we have the zoocyte <coughs> growth in our sodium poor cores of the plagioclase. This has been shown experimentally to be related to retrograde features. And we also have a decrease in aluminium and an increase in silicon uh, from cauterum of our magnesium horn blends in our edges of our cell. And this is indicative of a decreasing temperature during the growth of this amphibole, thus suggesting that it is a retrograde feature. So now we need to ask the question of what caused this platberg pineal metamorphism that we see in the Donkerfleet Valley. So we have large scale Lystric faulting present um, that has been associated with Ventersdorf because it doesn't intrude into our Transvaal sediments and thus should then predate the Transvaal. And they have found similar features on the gold fields um, on the Bits Basin margin. So what we propose is that a localized high apparent geotherm is related to an increase in temperature um, as a result of crustal thinning and magnetism that is then related to the Plattberg and Pineal uh, groups within the Fentersdorp supergroup. We already had an elevated apparent geotherm from the Kipper-Fiersberg group and now we've got the faulting which can increase our pressure and also increase our temperature. So what about other events? Is there anything else? And did we try any other forms of chronology? So I looked at sample DKV2, also from around the Dunkerfleet Valley, which is a kink banded microlayer within a quartzite. You can see our S1 foliation is uh, parallel to our bedding and we have S2 that comes in and crenulates it. So we did some argon argon work on it and we got repeat ages of about 2.12 um, billion years. And so it's not a clip of Beersburg, it's not a pineal or a bush belt age. So what is it? These um, argon argon plateaus are quite nice. So we don't think that it is an older event that has been partially reset. So what's going on? What caused this? So it is proposed to be related to orogeny as a result of the collision between the Pilbara and the Kartvel to form the Valbara craton that happened between 2.2 and 2.0 billion years. And there is ample evidence of fluid flow across the Kartvel craton at this time um, with ages between 2.14 and 2.12 billion years uh, from monazite and xenotime. And so we propose that 
this now shows some uh, record of the closing stages of this hydrothermal fluid circulation that occurred at around 2.15 billion years. So now to answer the question that's on everybody's mind is what's going on in the Fred Fort Dome and unfortunately I didn't quite clear everything up. I threw a couple of spanners in there but got some answers. And so we have four main metamorphic episodes in the Fred Fort Dome. We have our M1A which is related to the Kipper Fiersberg group at 2.79 billion years that we see in sample plate C. We have M1B metamorphism which is a localized platberg pineal metamorphism with a 2.69 billion year age that we see in the Dorcafleet Valley. We are then followed by an M2 metamorphism that is related to the hydrothermal fluid flow from the Volgara craton. Then we have M3 metamorphism, which is bushveld related overprint that we see in sample K12C and potentially in sample VDF04. And finally, we have the meteorite impact and any post impact metamorphism, so the recrystallizing of the pseudotaculite. So we know some answers, but there are many more questions to be answered uh, through this work. Are there any questions? Thank you, Kim. A very interesting story. Beautifully illustrated, short and sweet. So I'll open the floor up to questions. Let's maybe take some questions in the room first, and then we'll go online. Well, yeah, great question. So, I'm, I'm surprised that it's possible to preserve up to five metamorphic events and potentially a meter pillar. I mean, wouldn't the subsequent metamorphic events not be partially but totally obliterate all the potentially previous metamorphic events? So, what we think happens. So, yeah, okay. What we think happened is we had the first metamorphic event, our triple Petersburg event, in this case that they removed a lot of the fluids from the metapelites, so they were no longer as reactive as they would have been. Um, and so there's less reaction and we don't see any evidence of any um, diffusion within our garnets. And so the ages do seem to be quite robust. Okay, uh, we have a question from Sue. Sue, will you just speak loudly so the audience can hear you? Yeah. For the virtual audience, I mean. Um, on the, the first sill that you put in there, what depth and how thick was it? So it was an approximately 500 meter thick sill. So it is it's quite a big sill there. Um, but we do see evidence of these really thick fences of sills in the area. So so I was going to ask, do you see it on the surface somewhere? Yeah, yeah we do. Okay, because I was going to say that should show up on the seismic data also, <laughs> and that would be a good way to check for it. Okay, that's a very good yeah. point. Yeah, for George, um, just nice and loud. Good talk. Um, you were talking about the West Side Group shell around the period of the mm -hmm. We are sitting on West Side Group shells here. Which metamorphic event would uh, cause the metamorphism of the rocks? Yeah. So that's a very good question and certainly something that we'd be interested in looking into. Um, it is possible that we did have a faint historic event here that initially was the first event and could have mobilized the gold, um, but then it's been overprinted by these subsequent events. And to then go back to Robert's question about why would it then be preserved in the dome, and we could have more fluids coming from the Transvaal, for example. So a lot of the metamorphism for the basin margins is related to the bush belts, and so there may have been that fluid coming from Transvaal, which then overprinted all of these Previous Okay, I think um, we'll come to your question now, Karen. But I see a question from from Lou. Lou, you can unmute. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, you, you've convinced me that there's a, a, a Ventersdorp age heating event because you have Ventersdorp rocks in the area, and you have a Garnet age of approximately Ventersdorp age, but I, I will assert that the age, the ages for Ventersdorp, which is a very thick sequence, probably produced in a large igneous province. I, I would say that the ages aren't really very well constrained. A lot more uh, dating work needs to be done for Ventersdorp to 
for example, figure out if there's just one a large igneous province or two or maybe more. So, um, you know, at, at this point, I, I would hesitate to to connect any of your uh, garnet isochrons to Peniel or to Plattsburgh or whatever, you know. Wait until the, uh, the Frentersdorp dating gets better done. It's not going to be easy to do. Uh, but following on from that, regarding the Bushveld heating, would, would it be fair to say that you don't really have any direct evidence for a Bushveld thing? There is no Bushveld rocks that I know of in the area. Maybe I'm wrong. And none of your isochrons produced a Bushveld age. So to me, that is a bit speculative. I agree. Um, we don't have any direct chronological evidence for this bushveld overprint. Um, there are some bushveld sills present, um, particularly around sample K12C, and they are definitely something that I would want to take a look at to see if they have experienced anything as well and to get uh, better ages for it. I think a lot of the chronological work in Fred Fort may fix a lot of it has been just chemical correlations to the larger body of the Bushveld complex. And so it is entirely possible that there is no um, kind of Bushveld overprint, but just based on the thermochronology, uh, we can kind of imply and our thermobarometry, we can see that it is potentially a Bushveld event. How do you, can you tell us a little bit more about these Bushveld sills uh, why do you say they are bushveld? What's the evidence for that? Because they, they could equally well be Umkondo, which are known to be in the area. Uh, yeah, that is true. Um, but it has been kind of stated in many previous studies that there are these bushveld age cells that formed through the differentiation of a bushveld magma. Um, if you look at things like Kutsia et al. 2006, they studied a lot of these intrusions and they also found that they tended to uh, trend towards a Bushveld composition rather than an Ocondo composition. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Clara? Um, hi, Kim. I really enjoyed talking. Um, I was really happy to see that a lot of the results um, correlate really well with the results of the climate in the region of Greece, showing once again the agents. So the two studies seem to agree with each other in this way. Um, I was curious, the 2.2 event that you documented from the five agents, have you considered the head quit lodging the province as a potential cause of that? Um, we haven't, but it is certainly something we can look at. Um, kind of the latter half of the talk is still things we're trying to work out. Uh, the first half uh, will be going into a publication in South African Journal of Geology at some point, hopefully soon. Um, but it could well be related to that. And going back to your comment about the diamond ages, I did also date some garnets from a lower crustal xenolith from lace and also got some nice fancy sort of ages. And so it seems to all kind of fit in together. Okay, do we have any more questions from the floor or from the audience online? I don't see any hands up from the audience online, but uh, George, go for it. Um, can we, um, can you talk about the pedestal salt, but uh, there are plenty of pedestal age dikes that go cut through the uh, all of the sequence and so on. Um, uh, will it work as well if you use dikes including into the through the bits, uh, uh, sequence uh, to model your? Um, I think you have less of an influence of it because it'll be a far more localized metamorphism than it would for a salt because you'd just be metamorphosing that little bit of rock that's directly next to it. Whereas with a sill, you're gonna have this kind of top of high temperature that can then metamorphose whatever's below it to above it. Whereas with your dikes, it will just be whatever's vertically or laterally next to it. Okay, and then there's one last question in the chat uh, from Jeremy Lehman. Um, well, two questions now. She's typing furiously. Uh, thanks for the good talk. Are the garnet isochrons for the entire garnet crystal, or have you removed the rims to be sure to date the metamorphic event in the cores? And the second question, what are the relations between garnet fabrics, uh, sorry, between garnets and fabrics? Do you show some garnets in S1? Overall, how do these explain these fabrics in S1 and S2? Um, so for the isochrons, we did remove inclusions. Uh, we couldn't drill the garnets because of their grain size. 
Uh, for every garnet point on the isochron, you need about 100 milligrams of garnet, which at my kind of optimal picking rate, I was picking about five milligrams an hour. And for a four point isochron, that's a lot of picking to do. Um, and if we wanted to drill out just the cause, it would take even longer to do so. And so we picked the entire grains and then they went through a partial dissolution procedure to remove any inclusions and anything that was less resistive than the garnets. And these um, overgrowths are very um, inclusion rich. And so we work on the assumption that it would be removing a lot of that material as well and preserve primarily these very strong pores. Um, and then your garnet about the relationships between S1 and S2 and the garnets. Um, again, this is very difficult to see. These garnets are quite fine grained. And for the most part, we did see that in some cases, the S1 seemed to um, just slightly uh, bend around our garnets. And so we may have a thin growth over there of our S1 as well as our garnets. And then for the most part, we think that the garnets predate our S2 foliation. Okay, uh, I see Lou's hand is up again. I'm not sure if that's an old hand, Lou, but um, it's old. It's an old hand, Grant. Okay, thank you, Lou. Um, thank you, Kim. That was a fantastic talk, really enjoyed it. And thank you all for coming. Next week, uh, we have Karen Smith, who will be speaking about plume-related diamond formation at Furspurt in the central Kartwell crater. So we look forward to that, Karen. And uh, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you all same place, same time next week. And thank you, John. Thank you.